Well, we're going to do it again, and I'm hoping for the last time. If you've had people bothering you with all that really weird flat earth stuff, trying to tell you the flat earth is the historical Christian position, well, you might just want to see today's episode. Okay, I really, really, really debated whether or not we should do this topic again today because, well, I've done it once in the past and it kind of brought some really interesting people out of the woodwork. Apparently, it actually made some people mad and more people than you might think. Sadly, there's enough of what we're going to talk about going around right now that I really think it's becoming something of a widespread problem. It's not going away. So, I've decided to address this one last time, even though I think it's pretty silly. What am I talking about? It's the flat earth conspiracy people. And honestly, it's hard to believe that we need to talk about this in the 21st century. There just seems to be this relentless group of people who think that they've come into a very special body of knowledge. They've uncovered a vast conspiracy by NASA and every single government agency on the face of the planet to hide the fact that the earth is indeed flat. Now, just in case you belong to that group, let me just say that you're going to be wasting your time by writing me letters because I'm not going to answer them. And I know some of you are going to do it anyway, but I'm really not going to answer your letters. And yes, I absolutely believe in the Bible. Anybody who watches this program knows that I do. And no, I don't have to give any more answers after today. I really don't. All I'm going to do today is point out something I think is really, really important. You see, there, there's this misguided idea going around that the medieval Christian church actually believed the earth was flat, that it took the likes of Galileo, Copernicus, and finally Columbus and Magellan to disabuse the church of this idea. And honestly, this is important to think about because I've discovered a decidedly religious tone with a lot of these flat earth folks. I mean, there really are secular flat earth people as well, but from where I sit as a minister, they don't seem to get quite as worked up as the religious folks. The religious flat earth believers appear to think they've stumbled across a great conspiracy that must be exposed, that your salvation might be at stake if you don't accept what they're telling you. I've had these people show up at events where I'm speaking and they'll follow me around telling me that they're worried about how God's going to deal with me if I don't sit down and listen to them. And I can assure you, according to this book, my salvation has nothing to do with the shape of the earth. But now let's get back to this idea that the church has historically taught that the earth is flat and only changed that in recent history. This is an idea that some atheists love to promulgate because it makes Christians look a little ridiculous. But wouldn't you know it? It's not actually true. The church did not teach that the earth is flat, and neither did medieval Christian scholars. We've known the earth as a sphere for a really, really long time. Of course, that doesn't mean that the idea of a flat earth never showed up among Christians at all, because it did. And it's happening again. But today, it's the history of how this happened that I want you to think about, because it's not what you've been told, not even close. You really can find ancient Christian writers who promoted the idea of a flat earth. But here's the catch. There were only two of them. And until the 17 and 1800s, the rest of Christianity didn't take those guys seriously on just about anything they said. And I'll tell you who they were in just a moment. But before I get to that, let me introduce you to two other guys who were very popular speakers back in the 19th century because they traveled the countryside telling people that science and the Bible were irredeemably opposed to each other. Their names were John William Draper and Andrew Dixon White. Back in 1874, John William Draper published a book called A History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science. It was a bit of a, a manifesto, really a polemic work designed to ridicule the intelligence of most Christians. And because Draper had published a very popular history of science before he put this book out, and because he was a very popular and gifted speaker, a lot of people took this work to heart. Now, I'll give him credit where credit is due. 
he rightly pointed to the rise of Constantine in the marriage of church and state as a key turning point here in the West, a point where the church began to prize political power more than it did preaching the gospel. If you've been watching this show, you know I believe that's true. The marriage of church and state back in the 4th century was not a good thing and led to some really embarrassing episodes for the church. You know, like the burning of heretics at the stake and those kinds of things. But then Mr. Draper went one step further and suggested that the church rejected rationality and science at the very same time. Here's what he actually wrote. The antagonism we thus witness between religion and science is the continuation of a struggle that commenced when Christianity began to attain political power. Now, you'll notice that this is a popular sentiment to this day, much to the chagrin of a growing number of scientists who now realize that what you and I just read isn't actually true. The other guilty party in this story was the guy by the name of Andrew Dixon White, who was also a brilliant public speaker who never really had much trouble attracting an audience. When the American Civil War broke out, his speaking tours were no longer possible, so he ended up directing his efforts to the political scene in New York State. But he really, really, really missed his years of study and research. And so he enlisted the help of a really good friend, the Quaker Ezra Cornell, and the two of them founded a new university together. And you probably guessed which university it is. It's Cornell University. The idea behind this new school was that people who taught there would be completely free of all external influences, including religion. Now, a lot of people found that idea kind of repulsive in that day, even dangerous because they feared what might happen if their kids got an exclusively secular education. And so these two guys got a lot of opposition. In the end, the opposition made Mr. White a little bitter. So he composed a brand new lecture series he called The Battlefields of Science. The story he told? I'm sure you can guess it. He said religion is the absolute opposite of science. In fact, it's an enemy to science and a problem that had to be dealt with. The New York Daily Tribune printed that original lecture, and the rest is history. By 1896, Andrew White had published a really big book called A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. He openly told everybody that it was a response to what happened when they founded Cornell. I tried to be nice, he said, but now I'm going to play offense. Both Draper and White insisted that only a simpleton would continue to believe in the words of the Bible. And that's an idea you'll still find running rampant on the battlefield of modern social media. I'm sure you've seen some of these people in their posts. Oh, believe in fairy tales all you want, but I'm going to be dedicated to reason and science. So what would you guess would be one of the biggest points that Draper and White presented in these books of theirs? The church, they said, has historically taught that the earth is flat, and they even persecuted the people who said that it wasn't. The ancient Greeks, they said on the other hand, they were dedicated to science, and they knew the earth was a sphere. But the church, being steeped in ignorance, refused to accept that idea because the Bible told them otherwise. Today what these guys were teaching has come to be known as the conflict thesis, this idea that science and Christianity are at odds with each other. To this day, you'll see some skeptics using that idea to ridicule people of faith. But there's a problem. Either Draper and White didn't know their history, or they were being dishonest, because their theory doesn't hold anywhere near the water that some people think it does. I mean, did the church really persecute Columbus for saying the earth was a sphere? Did the church really teach that the earth was flat? The answer is... Absolutely not. And as soon as we take a really quick break, I'll come back to tell you what really happened. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. 
here's a problem I find when it comes to all this flat earth stuff. There's a handful of very vocal so-called believers who take advantage of social media to publish their misguided notions. What they do is insist that the Christian faith has always taught a flat earth until recent history. But then, in order to accommodate the evolutionists they teach, the church went apostate and agreed that the earth is round, or it's always some kind of variation of that. The problem is, none of that's true. The idea that the church believed in a flat earth was propagated by the likes of Draper and White. But where did they get that idea? Well, they got it from two ancient Christians named Lactantius and Cosmos, who were converts from paganism. What the skeptics will tell you is that all the church fathers believed in a flat earth. But again, that's not true. Go ahead and read all you want from the early Christians about the shape of the earth, and you'll only find two people who actually said that, Lactantius and Cosmos. Now, if you're watching the video version of this, I didn't have a picture of Cosmos, so this is just one of his maps I've put up on the screen. I'm guessing that before today, most of you have never even heard of these two guys. Do you know why? It's because they were essentially theological nobodies. Nobody believed what they said on a massive range of subjects. They were not influential. But now listen to what Mr. White said. He wrote about the church in a flat earth. And he writes, Some of the foremost men in the church devoted themselves to buttressing the model with new texts and throwing about it new outworks of theological reasoning. The great body of the faithful considered it a direct gift from the Almighty. I'm sorry, the foremost men of the church? Not even close. Lactantius and Cosmos were anything but. Let me read you something about Lactantius by a professor of history named Jeffrey Russell who said, his views eventually led to his works being condemned as heretical after his death. Now, Lactantius died in AD 325, which you'll note is a very long time ago. He continues, He maintained, for example, that God wills evil as a logical necessity, and that Christ and Satan are metaphorical twins, two angels, two spirits, one good and one evil, both created by God. In other words, Lactantius was a heretic. So it seems a little weird that Draper and White would insist that he was some kind of foremost thought leader in the early church. He wasn't. But of course, what about Mr. Cosmos, the other flat earth Christian from the very ancient past? Well, you get the same story. People liked him at the time because he was eloquent. But you will search high and low for the medieval scholar who took him seriously. Both of these guys were theological nobodies. And wouldn't you know it if you go back and read the real influencers of the early church, guys like Augustine or Aquinas, you will not find them talking about a flat earth. They said it was round. You know why? It's because the Christian church has always believed that. But just in case you're not convinced, let me read you just a little bit more, this time from the work of Alan Chapman, a historian at Oxford. This comes from his book, Slaying the Dragons. He says, let us be clear about one thing. No medieval scholar of any worth thought that the earth was flat. One needs only to read the astronomical literature of the Middle Ages to realize that the spherical nature of the earth, about 6,000 or 8,000 miles across, was standard knowledge and taught to university students from Salamanca to Prague. Inherited an unbroken succession from the Greeks, in fact, taught by the Venerable Bede to the young monks of Jero Abbey in AD 710, and encapsulated in John of the Holy Wood's Latin textbook, De Sphera Mundi, on the sphere of the earth of around 1240. But what about that old story about how the church persecuted Christopher Columbus for saying the earth was round? Well, remember, we just discovered that the spherical earth was being taught to university students in Salamanca in the medieval period. And the legend goes that it was a council at Salamanca that condemned Mr. Columbus for his round earth beliefs. So how could that be? Well, it, it didn't happen. What the church disputed with Columbus was the size of the globe, not the shape. The Greek mathematician Eratosthenes had already calculated the circumference of the earth in his famous Egyptian experiment back in 240 BC. He noticed that when he looked down a well in the city of Cyrene at 12 noon on the summer solstice, his head completely blocked the reflection of the sun. That meant that the sun was directly overhead. So then he put a stick in the ground at noon on the summer solstice in Alexandria, about 
5,000 stadia to the north. His stick now cast a shadow because the sun was to the south and not directly overhead. And the angle of the shadow was 7 degrees 12 minutes, which is 1 50th of a circle. So he multiplied 5,000 stadia by 50 and came up with a remarkably accurate number. In fact, he actually came within 100 miles of the actual circumference of the Earth. The problem that Columbus faced had nothing to do with a flat Earth. His problem was that he was using a different measurement. We think it was one that was calculated by Ptolemy. And Ptolemy was wrong. His number was too small. So Columbus figured the trip to Asia was a lot shorter than it really was. That was what they were arguing about at Salamanca. It had nothing nothing to do with the shape of the earth. So where did we get the idea that the church believed in a flat earth at that time? Well, we got it from an American novelist, Washington Irving, who wrote a fictionalized account of Columbus back in 1828. And he wrote this, Columbus was assailed with citations from the Bible and the Testament, the book of Genesis, the Psalms of David, the prophets, the epistles, and the gospels. To these were added the expositions of various saints and reverend commentators. St. Chrysostom and St. Augustine, St. Jerome and St. Gregory, St. Basil and St. Ambrose. You see, Irving wanted us to think that the church was quoting the ancient church fathers to prove the earth was flat. And in the novel, when Columbus tries to refute these guys, they mock him. But again, none of that ever happened. Sometimes when you go back and read history, it can seem a little bland. So maybe we can forgive Mr. Irving for trying to spice it up a little bit except that his wrong ideas kind of took root. The problem today is that even well-meaning Christians are starting to buy this idea, and they insist that the flat earth was Christianity's traditional position. And it wasn't. And in the process, these people are giving skeptics plenty of fuel for their fire because they're making the faith community seem absolutely ridiculous. I mean, let's just think about this. What would it take to get the whole world to tell the same scientific lie? Every single scientist at NASA, every politician, every church leader, every photographer, every astronomer, absolutely everybody on the earth has to cooperate. If you've ever tried to keep a secret, you know how preposterous that is. And here's the ironic thing. Flat earth Christians will tell you that they're trying to defend the word of God against the godless, against the evolutionists, and wouldn't you know it? It was the skeptics, guys like Draper and White, who made that story up in the first place to discredit the church and defend Darwin. But Christians really believe that, Sean. The round earth is a new idea. No, it's not. Not even close. And after we take another really quick break, I'll demonstrate that. So enjoy your ride on this very round ball we call home, and I'll be right back after this. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, but that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. There are people out there who want you to believe that the Christian church actually thought the earth was flat up until relatively recent times. But honestly, these folks just haven't done their homework. You might remember reading Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer when you were in high school. It's a collection of stories told by travelers to pass the time. And here's a line you find in the chapter called The Franklin's Tale. Aurelius, with blissful heart anon, answered thus, Fly on a thousand pound, this wide world, which that men say is round. Wait a minute, I thought these guys believed the earth was flat. This was written more than a hundred years before Columbus, and nobody tried to burn Chaucer at the stake for writing that. Now, here's the Venerable Bede, who lived in the late 600s and early 700s AD, and he's writing a textbook. He said, The cause of the unequal length of the days is the globular shape of the earth. For it is not without reason that the sacred scriptures and secular letters speak of the earth as an orb. For it is a fact that the earth is placed in the center of the universe, not only in latitude, as if it were round like a shield, but also in every direction, like a playground ball, no matter what way it is turned. Now that was a good 800 years before Columbus, 
and you'll notice how careful he is. He says the Earth is not like a shield or a disc, which is what the flat Earth people want you to believe that the Earth Church used to teach. But hundreds of years ago, Bede was telling his students, it's a sphere. It's a ball. About all we can criticize there is the way he places the Earth at the center of the universe, which we did believe at the time. And you know what never happened? The Venerable Bede was not condemned by the church for saying that. You know why? They all knew the Earth was a sphere, full stop. Historically speaking, there are only two exceptions, Lactantius and Cosmos, and nobody took them seriously. And this idea that Columbus's crew was terrified they were going to sail off the edge of the Earth? Also nonsense. I mean, they did have two complaints. One, that the trip was taking longer than expected. And two, it might be impossible to get back home because the winds were going in the wrong direction. But all those men knew the Earth was a sphere. And I know right now there are some people watching or listening who are getting mad. And you think I'm a deceiver or that I don't believe the Bible. I can assure you, I believe it. I spend hours in the Bible every single day. But just for the sake of argument, let's say you're right. Just for a moment. The Earth is a disk covered by an impermeable canopy. The moon landings were faked by Kubrick, and we've never been to space, and there's a massive conspiracy keeping us from seeing what's on the other side of the ice wall in Antarctica. Let's just say for the sake of argument, all of that is true. I still have a question for you. So what? I think I asked that the last time we talked about this. But again, so what? What difference does this make to your daily life? When you get up tomorrow morning, how is that knowledge going to make one bit of difference in your life? Are you Elon Musk? Are you planning a space voyage? Are you planning to launch a satellite? You're not. All you're doing is making Christians look like simpletons, and you're playing right into the hands of the people who concocted this idea in the first place to discredit Christianity. And you're violating a principle that Paul taught when he was dealing with pointless debates. Let me remind you of what he said to his young protege, Pastor Timothy. He wrote, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Honestly, you're wasting your life with this stuff. And that applies equally to all those conspiracy theories that people seem to love, especially right here in the United States of America. The gospel is magnificent the way it is, and it doesn't need your help to make it more sensational. So stop! For the life of me, I can't think of one good outcome here. Instead of attracting people to the scriptures, you're playing into the hands of the skeptics. You're actually promoting the idea that faith and science are opposed to each other, and they're not. In fact, you'll notice that most of what we've discovered in the scientific revolution happened at the hands of people who believed that the universe was orderly, because it was created by an intelligent God. I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. All right, I think, I think my rant is finished and hopefully this will be the last time we ever have to come to this topic. I guess the reason I'm on it again today is because for some reason, for some reason, I appear to have been anointed the Apostle to the Twilight Zone. I, I don't know what it is, but I sure get a lot of strange letters. Here in America, the number of people who get into this kind of stuff is kind of alarming. But as a Christian, I find it even more alarming when it shows up inside the church. Now, just in case you missed the last time I talked about this, I looked at the supposed proofs of Mr. Samuel Rowbottom. So if you've come across that name during your internet travels, you might want to go back and watch the episode on what he said. I'm sure you can find it somewhere here on our website. Because Mr. Rowbottom was not only thoroughly debunked, but his supporters actually refused to pay a wager they'd made in the papers when someone 
definitively proved him wrong. So in that episode, we dealt with the theory itself, the theory of the flat earth. And today we've looked at some of the fallout that's taking place in the Christian community. The people who preach this stuff are quite literally playing into the hands of the skeptics. They're underlining a story that was made up by skeptics about the church that has never been true. I can't remember if I brought this up last time, but the whole thing kind of reminds me of that servant girl that Paul had to rebuke. You might remember the story. She was a known occultist, a possessed girl, and she was following Paul around town saying something that was technically true. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. So that was kind of true. So what's the problem with it? Everybody knew what she was. She was possessed. And now she appeared to be on the side of the gospel. That's why Paul put an abrupt stop to what she was doing. So ask yourself, have you become so possessed by a meaningless conspiracy theory that you're busy doing the same thing this girl was? Maybe you're caught up in some peripheral idea like the flat earth and you're using it to try and convince people that the Bible is a reliable document. Let me assure you today, you are doing precisely the opposite. You're using something that just ain't so to try and make your point. And believe me, it makes your listeners think you're nuts. I know that's blunt, but it's true. What you're doing is driving people away, making them think that the Christian faith is not reasonable or intelligent. And please, you have got to stop doing this. I mean, you go ahead, flip through the pages of the Bible and see if you can find that place where we're told that's what Jesus told the church to preach. Flat earth. I can promise you, it's not there. You know, a few years ago, I was visiting an Inuit village up in the Arctic, and I was sharing Bibles with the people who lived there, Bibles in the Inuktitut language. And when I was walking through town, I noticed something kind of strange. Their satellite dishes were all pointed downward, not parallel to the ground, but actually pointing down. Do you know why? They're trying to get the signals that spill over the horizon from the satellites that orbit the planet close to the equator. And I suddenly smiled as I thought about it because this signal, this show, goes up there too on those very satellites. And what am I beaming up there? The story of the Bible, which does not disagree with how this word is getting up there to the Arctic. In fact, I've been teaching the Bible over satellite for a really long time now, and once in a while I go outside at night and I watch those satellites pass over my head, and I thank God that I live in a time when those are available to me. And now I hope I've said my final piece. Time to quit wasting our lives on meaningless conspiracies because people have real problems and the shape of the planet isn't one of them. Thanks for joining me. You've been watching Authentic. You want to help more people see Authentic for free? Like, comment, and subscribe. And share this episode. That tells the algorithm you really like the show, which in turn recommends Authentic to a lot more people. Thanks for your support.